Good afternoon. Um, thank you all for joining us today. My name is Jacob Charles and I'm the Executive Director of the Center for Firearms Law here at Duke. We're really excited and pleased to be joined by Professor Jennifer Carlson, who is the Associate Professor in the School of Sociology and the School of Government and Public Policy at the University of Arizona. We'll be talking with her today about her new recent book called Policing the Second Amendment, Guns, Law Enforcement and the Politics of Race. For the format for today, um, we'll have a moderated discussion between myself and Professor Carlson for about the first 40 to 45 minutes, um, and then we'll answer audience Q&A to the extent that folks have questions for Professor Carlson about her book. Um, so feel free to enter your questions into the Q&A anytime during the conversation, and we'll, we'll get those um, all um, through the end. We'll get through as many of those as we can. Um, but first off, um, thanks for joining us here, Professor Carlson. Hello, it's so great to be here and I'm I'm so excited to be here talking about my book as well as really grateful for the time that everybody uh uh, the organizers as well as the uh, attendees. I know that time is in really short supply these days, so I super appreciate uh, this opportunity to discuss uh, the the um, yeah all of the all of the substance of my book. So um, thank you. Yeah, of course, and incredibly timely um, book that just happened to come out in the year 2020. Um, and incredibly co timely conversation. Um, so first of all, can you just start off talking a little bit about how you came to write a book about guns and police? For sure. So it seems like such an obvious topic. I think uh, when we think about it, maybe from the perspective of no, uh, November 2020, but um, it was actually surprising to me as, as I was researching um, gun carry culture, the politics of guns, how little analysis had been done, historical analysis, sociological analysis, uh, even legal analysis on the intersection of public law enforcement and the politics of guns. But the real sort of um, you know impetus for me writing this book was actually in my, my research for my first book, Citizen Protectors, The Everyday Politics of Guns in an Age of Decline. So that book was all about the politics of gun carry. So it focused on Michigan, particularly the Metro Detroit area, and asked the question of why do Americans, particularly American men, uh, are, why are they not just owning guns but carrying guns? As I'm sure everybody on this call, on this um, Zoom is is well aware, there's been a massive shift over the last several decades in not just um, you know owning guns but actually carrying them and primarily owning them and carrying them for self defense reasons. So I was hanging out with open carriers, concealed carriers. I interviewed them, I went through NRA training. And one of the things that kept coming up was how uh, how, how gun carriers thought about themselves vis-a-vis -vis the police. So I heard kind of two versions of this that were split across uh, or down racial lines. One version, which is um, sort of, you know, the police should be happy, they should be really excited that I'm, you know, if they, they hear that I'm a, a lawfully um, armed uh, private civilian, they should see me as, you know, helping them with their job and helping you know, promote social order. They shouldn't see me as a threat. Uh, and those were, that was actually a, kind of across the board uh, in terms of um, carry, gun carriers of color as well as white gun carriers. But the gun carriers of color also had sort of a, another layer of that, which is that they worried that their guns would not just be uh, tools of safety and security, as we often hear about in pro-gun discourse, but that guns, uh, that their gun would also be a vehicle for their criminalization. That if they were stopped by police, they would um, they would be rendered more vulnerable by virtue of having a gun, even if that gun was lawfully lawfully possessed, uh, lawfully um, lawfully carried, and all of that. And I saw that actually really uh, play out, or I heard that play out actually with um, uh, African American gun carriers who chose to open carry, uh, and they actually uh, were in the habit of of not just holstering their guns but also holstering a tape recorder. And one of these uh, one of these gun carriers actually shared with me a tape recording of police, you know, kind of running through the mill of you know running his numbers, telling him you know is he really legal, questioning his capacity to exercise, um, you know, what is most certainly in the Metro Detroit area seen as um, See, you know, seen as as an everyday right, uh, and we can also see it in the case of Philando Castile, who was uh, essentially killed on site despite being lawfully armed, uh, because because the officer that stopped him um, was was 
afraid, saw him as a threat, saw him as a as an armed black danger, a man who is therefore dangerous. And so this raised the whole question of sort of not just what do gun carriers think about the police, but what do police um, think about gun carriers? So in order to unravel that in this book, I talked to police chiefs, I talked to police chiefs across Arizona, Michigan, California. Those are obviously states that have really different uh, gun cultures and gun laws. I also attended gun boards, which are um, no longer actually exist in Michigan, where I did my research. They've uh, since been abolished, but um, they are this really fascinating context to see uh, how these shall issue regimes, which we presume to be non-discretionary, and of course that's the big story that we often talk about with regard to the shift in concealed carry laws that we move from a may issue system to a shall issue system, and now you know, quote unquote, anyone who wants to can get a firearms license, and of course there's statutory. Um, statutory requirements, but even within those statutory requirements, I saw a lot of discretion and it was um, uh, definitely uh, illuminated by thinking about this discretion uh, through the lens of race. Uh, so so yeah, so that kind of led me down the path of really trying to disentangle what's the relationship between law enforcement and uh, gun politics. And so I ended up writing my book, uh, Policing the Second Amendment to, to try and pull it all together. Yeah. So, so one thing you know early in the book, and that kind of becomes an organizing principle, is the relationship between public law enforcement and the Second Amendment. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering, can, can you can you explain a little bit of the history there, and particularly maybe um, gun rights organizations, especially the National Rifle Association, its intentional development of ties in a relationship with public law enforcement. Sure. And I just want to apologize for the Arizona sunshine piercing through my window. <laughs> I'm sure everybody in a gloomy, you know, in gloomy winter is, yeah, yeah, but... <laughs> So, um, so in terms of the NRA and public law enforcement, this was actually one of the most fascinating uh, sort of surprises as that I that I found as part of this research. And so, you know, we we think about sort of um, law enforcement, particularly in the context of the gun debate, as sort of this very much prized ally. Both gun control, uh, gun violence prevention activists, and uh, gun rights uh, activists really want to kind of present the police as their natural allies. Now, a lot. Of people will look at the police and think, well, you know, having guns proliferating in the hands of private civilians, that is probably going to make their job harder. And so it would be, you know, we, we might assume that police would be naturally uh, predisposed to be in favor of, of tightened gun restrictions. Uh, on the flip side of that, though, we know that police uh, tend to be more conservative. Uh, police subculture in many ways overlaps with uh, gun, gun culture in terms of its values, its predispositions, uh, certainly in terms of the concern about um, safety and security as being an urgent everyday concern in their lives. Um, so, so it's kind of an open question in terms of how that actually falls. And if you, if, in, in terms of how law enforcement actually falls in this debate. And so if you look at the course of the 20th century and into the 21st century, what you actually see is sort of this constant vying between these two sides, uh, especially after the 1960s where the gun debate um, starts to take the shape that is now now very familiar to us today in terms of the two the two sides gun control and gun rights um, but even as early as um, 1916 uh, the NRA was sort of promoting this idea that, um, you know, police should have should be armed, they should be armed in order to deal with the threat of gun violence. So this idea that police, you know, one of the things that we often talk about is police in the United States are defined by the gun and the badge. And the idea that police would all be armed, that they would all be uh, given stand standard issued firearms, that's actually relatively new. So law enforcement itself is relatively new. It really emerged in the middle of the 1900s across the US uh, and uh, sorry, the 1800s um, and then into the 1900s um, at, the, at the turn of the century, that's where we really see sort of the shift toward uh, standard issue firearms and obviously into the, the 1950s and 60s, that's just accelerated with police militarization. But at this early point, it was the NRA that actually advocated that, for example, um, police should be qualified on their fire. Firearms. So this, this language of qualification is actually language that the NRA used very early on. So, um, so, you know, if we look at the history, we can see after the 1960s, when gun violence becomes this sort of um, matter of acute public, uh, public debate, public, uh, you know, moral panic, um, you know, there's, there's a huge apparatus of crime control that's, that's marshaled to deal with uh, the threat of violent crime. Uh, and so we see sort of, um, those alliances sort of shift in really interesting ways. The NRA trying to sort of uh, 
you know, frame itself as the tough on crime, but pro sort of pro America, pro Second Amendment, uh, conservative force, and obviously the gun control um, side, you know, framing gun control as not simply an issue of protecting uh, victims of gun violence, but particularly uh, protecting police. And that's where the intersection of sort of Daryl Gates, for example, who was uh, LAPD police chief, he actually um, was one of the inventors, he, he claims he was the inventor, but it was actually a group of, of officers who were kind of in the mix, um, who invented uh, this idea of SWAT, a specialized uh, attack unit, which is what its original, uh, the, the original language that they used to describe it, emerged out of their experience uh, with the Watts riots in the um, in 1960s LA. And so what you have actually is by, by the time you get to the 1980s under the war on crime, the war on drugs, Daryl Gates is actually advocating not just that police arm up so that police militarize and you know embrace SWAT tactics and that sort of thing, but also that they uh, aggressively support the disarming of um, you know, the, the people they deem as you know essentially the enemies in the war on crime. And so this is the moment where you have Daryl Gates, for example, um, advocating for the assault weapons ban at the the California state level as well as at the federal level. And so when you see that sort of, you know, the, the flank of uh, police behind uh, then President Bill Clinton signing into law the assault weapons ban, uh, that is as much a, a act of, of gun control as it is an act of, um, you know, a, a, a bill that's about promote, uh, promulgating the war on crime. So, so yeah, so that's kind of a, in a nutshell, sort of, sort of the, the very interesting ways in which uh, that played out over the 20th century. But the story for the 21st century is that the NRA has actually um, done a great deal, especially after the signing of the assault weapons ban at the federal level in um, promoting gun rights to police. And it's not to say that they weren't doing it before. They have had a, you know, a division just for law enforcement since 1960 uh, that targets law enforcement with training and, and all sorts of things, but they're, activities to sort of think about the police as political allies that they can't afford to lose uh, definitely became more front and center in the aftermath of, of the early 90s. So one kind of one lesson from that um, history and that you talk about and, and kind of frames the book is that you can't put law enforcement in a bucket of either just for guns or against guns, that guns are seen as good in some people's hands and bad in other people's hands. And you talk about these, these two kind of frames and one is gun militarism and, and, and how it kind of is personified in the, the warrior identity for law enforcement. Um, can you talk about gun militarism, what that is and how the kind of the warrior identity fits into that? Yeah, for sure. So gun militarism, you know, I, I can't claim to uh, have invented this, obviously, from, from whole cloth. Gun militarism is something that is, I think, kind of intrinsically familiar to those of us who follow uh, gun debates, debates about the police. Uh, it really captures the side of policing that you know, we see in terms of conversations about police militarism, militarization and uh, sort of the, the increasing turn of police to militarize tactics, the tendency of police to see um, policing at, in, in martial terms. So see it in terms of, you know, domination and, um, you know, controlling, controlling the grid, um, you know, that sort of thing. And really these are all sort of uh, ways of thinking about policing that are very endemic to uh, urban context. So policing communities, of color, and this is that's that's where um, obviously the the racial piece comes in in terms of thinking about this as. Um, as a, a way of imagining legitimate violence and the distribution of legitimate violence. So this entire sort of apparatus that I try and develop in the, in the book, uh, it really uh, tries to get at sort of how race informs how we think about how, uh, how legitimate violence should be distributed across society. So should the state monopolize it and take it away from people and, and, and not allow people access to, to firearms? Obviously that's the key form of legitimate violence in, um, in the US. Or, um, or the key, key form that we debate, or is it, do we want a kind of society where actually um, legitimate violence is shared across state and society? And so in the context of sort of urban gun crime um, and these sort of ideas about policing where police are imagined as warriors, they're imagined as fighting a war on drugs, on violence, on what have you, um, that, and this is a war fought in communities of color where uh, people of color are seen not as uh, the 
the people to be served and protected, but rather the people to be policed. Uh, that's where you get um, that's where you get this this idea of gun militarism emerging. And so it's you know you hear it actually from both sides of the gun debate when um, you know people say things like we just we we need to enforce the gun the gun laws we have aggressively. You see it in sort of the proliferation of gun laws that. Um, and we don't usually call them gun control, but we, we could. Uh, gun laws that are, you know, three strikes gun laws, mandatory minimum gun laws, um, gun laws that um, actually borrow the sort of um, logics of the, the war and crime more generally, but focus on um, people who are possessing and using guns unlawfully. And I should say that, you know, obviously when, when I say that, I'm not just talking about sort of uh, increased penalties for people involved in homicides and, and you know, assault and and that sort of thing, but even increased penalties, for example, uh, for people who are committing crime, but there happens to be a firearm that they possess while that crime, which may have nothing to do with a firearm, it may um, be a nonviolent crime, but that the presence of that firearm may um, may very well escalate uh, the 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 penalty and what prosecutors can can actually charge. And so, in a lot of ways, you know, we're very familiar with um, how possession, the criminalization of possession, works vis-a-vis -vis drugs. Uh, but there's a very similar dynamic that's actually happening with guns. And so that's where, um, so yeah, so that's kind of um, why I think it's really important to think not just in terms of gun control versus gun rights, but actually think in terms of um, these these different ways of, of imagining how legitimate violence should be distributed. So the first one that I talk about in the book is, is gun militarism. Yeah, and so I'm just wondering whether you think that this gun militarism framing is cause of what you call the war on guns or partial cause of that, um, or whether it is um, an effect of that war on guns. Like to what, what's the interaction there between like late 19th, late 20th century punitive turn, uh, war on crime generally and, and gun militarism? Yeah, so first of all, I wanna apologize because I think everybody just heard my cats brawling. So I, I'm sorry about that. Uh, as far as the relationship between gun militarism and the war on crime, I think that uh, they're they're intimately related. So I don't think this is a one cause the other. I think that they're co-constitutive and that the sort of, again, going back to this idea that in the context of uh, a highly punitive society like the US, but of course the US is not the only example of this, how guns come to figure as objects of um, as, as objects either of crime and danger versus safety and security are going to be wrapped up into that logic of, of you know the broader war on crime and so the 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 pro gun side of that or sort of the the side of that that advocates for expanded gun rights sees guns as sort of this last you know this stopgap this this you know one last thing that when you know crime is rampant life is insecure and we can't depend on the state necessarily you know, when you dial 911 and seconds matter, the police are only minutes away. That's a, you know, really well-worn uh, uh, pro-gun uh, slogan. Uh, that is, um, yeah, so that, that kind of um, makes, the appeal, makes the appeal of guns more urgent. But the flip side of that is also when we do have, you know, pass laws and think about, you know, how guns should be restricted or regulated, it's not in this sort of gun control uh, the, the, the form of gun control that we might see if we look to England or Canada or Australia, it's a form of, of gun control that is very much uh, pertinent to that war on crime sort of context, which is, um, as I've already described, this sort of tough on guns, war on guns kind of um, kind of approach. So yeah, I, I can't, I, I don't think that it's, um, I, I, I think it's, it's, there's so many factors that kind of go into both uh, determining our sort of pro-gun culture in the United States, but also um, using, and I think this is the race piece of this, you know, if we look at the history of race in America and racial inequality in America and white supremacy in America, uh, we see that, you know, many tactics, may, whether it's uh, private tactics, whether, whether it's state strategies, can be deployed in the service of um, racial inequality. And I think that in, you know, the story of the post 1960s is that by and large, it is crime and criminalization that becomes uh, one of the major uh, means of reproducing and um, and deepening racial inequality in in the United States, and so I think that in in so we could say it's war. And it's you know there's certainly something going on with the war on crime and this sort of punitive turn, and there's deep historical roots of that. But then there's also this sort of um, longstanding, persistent reproduction and deepening of racial inequalities in the in the U.S. 
Yeah, and so one thing you know when you discuss this war on guns is that there's been, especially recently, a pretty broad and bipartisan criticism of the war on drugs, but not a similarly broad reckoning with the racialized enforcement of the war on guns. Um, why do you think that is? And, and do you think that politics are changing at all? Yeah, I think there's a there's several reasons for that. So one reason I think is that the and 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 I think this is you know this is pretty uncontroversial to say, especially as you know sitting in Arizona, we just legalized uh, marijuana, which is. <laughs> shocking to say in a way. Uh, but I think that, you know, obviously, we've had a lot of, um, you know, debate about, you know, nonviolent crimes versus violent crimes, we tend to, uh, especially with the criticism, you know, sort of critiques of the war on crime and mass incarceration, uh, that has been kind of the opening conversation, right, to talk about who's incarcerated for nonviolent felonies, nonviolent misdemeanors, and, you know, people are whose lives are being destroyed for what is essentially um, not a crime against persons, not a violent crime, um, you know, and 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 yeah, what what people might call a victimless crime. Although I know people debate that term as well. So I think that when you bring guns into the picture, it's it's very so people's reaction is very different, right? Um, I think that so that's the first thing. I think the other um, the other, and so I think oh sorry, just to, to close that thought, I think that people, uh, particularly academics, have um, you know have have had more sort of motivation to study the the, the drug related issue rather than the gun related issue from this from this perspective i also think the big um the the other piece is that and it kind of you know fits in with what I just said about sort of guns are, sorry, drugs are seen as, you know, they're, they're victimless, it's victimless crime. And, you know, it's it's an easier sort of sell um, that there seems to be more moral clarity with regard to, to guns and crime. And really the only way, and this is, I mean, this was also the case with drugs at one point, the only way to kind of break that apart is to have people who are impacted by the realities of these laws and these, you know, these these policing structures and strategies and, and actually have them part of the conversation. Um, and I think that we have done a much better job of doing that with regard to drugs than with regard to guns. If we look at who is on the, the sort of, uh, you know, who are the leaders of uh, the gun violence prevention movement and the gun, you know, gun rights movement, uh, they tend to be a pretty homogenous group of people. I know that that's uh, changing, but, uh, you know, that that's that's also part of why I think we, we have sort of this stuck conversation because um, we do have sort of uh, people from a very homogenous white, you know, mostly men, uh, people who are sitting at the table. And so I think, you know, when we when we have diverse voices coming in and seeing and and actually, uh, you know, sharing their experiences of how these policies actually work on the ground, we get a very different kind of conversation and a different kind of way of thinking about these issues. Yeah, so we, we've talked a little bit about gun militarism and the war on guns and kind of the politics there. Um, and you contrast that with this other framing, which is gun populism um, and its identity in the guardian role um, for law enforcement. So can you talk about um, gun populism and then how it kind of differed in its um, and how it looked in the, across the three, three jurisdictions that you studied? Sure. Yeah. So I I would say that the first sort of hint that I got that there was something really different going on in the way that pol the police chiefs I interviewed across Arizona, California, and Michigan, the way that they understood gun violence happening in suburban and rural areas. So areas that are kind of coded as middle class, white sort of places, safe places, quote unquote, safe places where vi gun violence shouldn't happen um, versus urban communities that are racialized, that are seen as as more violent, as, as more crime ridden and that sort of thing. One of the sort of uh, first uh, really dramatic uh, differences uh, that I noticed in terms of thinking through what's, what's going on here in terms of how police are understanding guns and gun violence in these two different kinds of spaces was the emotions that police attached to gun violence in suburban and rural areas as compared to um, urban places. So going back to a previous question when you asked me about the warrior, you know, warrior policing, if you look at kind of the emotive valence of it, it is um, running toward the threat, it is danger, it is a soldier's kind of attitude toward policing. 
and you know it's 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 hardcore it's 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 all of those kinds of um you know aggression and that sort of thing that is what is sort of valorized in the context of, of warrior policing and you can see this with um you know the 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 training and and all the sort of ways in which uh, warrior policing is is taught to and promoted to police when I talk to police, though, vis-a-vis uh, -vis the issue of mass shootings in urban, or sorry, suburban and rural areas, I got a very different kind of set of emotions. I heard police chiefs saying things like, if I was off duty and I wasn't carrying my gun and I didn't respond uh, or I couldn't respond to an active shooting that happened to, you know, take place in a movie theater or, you know, the strangest of places, that was one of the terms that uh, a chief used, I would feel ashamed, I would feel devastated, I would feel like all those lives were lost on me. So a really, really different way of thinking about um, gun violence is a policing problem and and sort of the emotional the the emotional sort of uh valence that police bring to uh bring to dealing with policing problems on their on their um as part of their jobs so um so going back then to the bigger question of, of police populism what i found is that police chiefs so it, it wasn't that there were these police chiefs who thought this and these police chiefs who thought that uh they toggled between gun popularism and gun militarism but when they talked about i knew they were talking about gun populism or that they were sort of articulating this this very distinct way as compared to gun militarism of imagining legitimate violence being shared across state and society because they would say things like i can't always be there and you know good people need to be able to defend themselves i know that we do the best we can but we can't always do it ourselves they would say things like you know if i'm getting my butt kicked i don't care if it's a police officer or if it's a lawfully armed civilian I want backup and whoever can step into that first responder role, uh, that's, that, that, that's, that's who we need to respond. And so really this emphasis on first responders, I talk about this in the book is being really linked to Columbine and sort of the shift in policing after Columbine. Police responded to Columbine in 1999 with basically a contain and wait strategy that was basically thrown out the window with Columbine and now um, every, Every officer arriving on the scene is is trained to think of themselves as a first uh, as a first responder, and so I think that part of what happens with police or what I try to get at with police populism is actually this blurring of lines between police, uh, public law enforcement, and civilians, private privately armed uh, private legally armed civilians and even police themselves would sort of slip um as i asked them about their off-duty guns for example they would slip in between uh sort of talking themselves about themselves as public officers versus uh privately or uh, private armed civilians uh so so po so police populism tries to get at this kind of idea of um you know, the shared uh, legitimate violence across state and society. And how this kind of all boils down to race is that as police sort of talked about why they they supported gun, guns in the hands of lawfully armed civilians, again and again, it was sort of this nod to uh, white middle class respectability. It was not just a nod to that, but um, in contrast to both the, you know, the bad people with guns, uh, as well as elites who, you know, don't know any, who, who are either ignorant or willfully trying to disarm, um, you know, the good people who who need to be able to defend themselves. So I talk about in the in the three different states, Arizona, California, and Michigan, different ways that this plays out. So the gun militarism stuff, I saw that uh, pretty consistently across the three states, which makes sense because these three states are very similar. In fact, the U.S. as a whole is very similar in terms of its war on crime uh, approach to gun criminalization and criminalization more generally, but as far as gun laws, uh, I'm sure everybody on this call knows that gun laws are very dramatically different across the US. Uh, where I sit in Arizona, you don't need a license to carry a gun. Uh, as long as you can legally own it, you can be 18. And if you can legally, if you legally possess a pistol, you can open carry it. Uh, there's all, you know, obviously, we have stand your ground. It's a it's it's absolutely in a different universe in terms of gun laws than California, a neighboring state where, you know, background checks for um, guns, ammo, uh, there's, it's not a shell issue system, it's a may issue system for um, for getting a gun license. And so what I saw was that how police populism actually um, emerged and, and uh, 
kind of was was articulated was very sensitive to these different uh, socio legal regimes of, of gun policy. So in California, it was really focused on anti elitism. And so that's the populism part. Uh, it's this this idea that lawmaker lawmakers, um, they disarm the good guys. Uh, and this is also, by the way, in the context of the rollback of the war on crime that's been happening in California. So gun policy actually um, became a way for police chiefs to sort of point out the hypocrisy that they saw in lawmakers who wanted to control guns, but roll back and soften the war on crime. Um, and so police chiefs in California very much saw themselves as sort of um, not just saying that they, they were uh, advocates of not criminalizing people who would not otherwise be criminal, but for their, but for guns and gun law, California gun laws, but also they saw that California gun laws um, made their jobs very difficult and um, made it, it, it very difficult for them to enforce, um, enforce the law in, in their views. Uh, so anti-elitism was a huge piece of the California, um, the California story. In Michigan, uh, I talk about it as co-policing because it was very much articulated as, you know, police chief saying things like, I can't always be there. Um, you know, if I'm not there, I would like someone else to be able to defend themselves, this sort of thing. And then, um, I'm sorry, crime fighting by proxy was Michigan's. Um, so, so if police can't be there, at least that that armed civilian might be there to, to fight crime on the, you know, on the imagined behalf of social order. And then co-policing was Arizona. Co-policing was, um, where uh, Arizona chiefs would actually say, you know, I don't want civilians, private civilians necessarily, you know, jumping in and, and constantly trying to, <laughs> to do my job for me. But when push comes to shove, I see a place for civilians to act as first responders uh, alongside police. And, you know, some for some chiefs, this, this was embraced. For some chiefs, it was definitely less enthusiastic, but it was a marked, uh, markedly different way of sort of thinking about gun populism in Arizona as compared to the other two states. So maybe this question is trying to do the same thing I did before and trying to, to tease apart things that are really co-constitutive here, but I'm wondering if you think the differences in how police chiefs in these three jurisdictions are, are responding is a result of the governing legal regime. In other words, because Arizona has gone lax, that police are responding to that regime by, you know, um, by, by thinking co-policing is, is a good thing, or whether there are kind of deep, deeper cultural, extra legal um, attachments that are guiding both this, this framing of how they see private civilian gun use um, and maybe also influencing the legal regime. In other words, is it, is it, is it, is it the culture, is it cultural that's, that's governing, that's driving everything else, or is the legal regime what's driving these police chiefs views of what's good use of guns? Yeah, and so much of the answer to that, that question and those kinds of questions is a question of how, how deep we're gonna dig and how far back we're going to dig, right? Because law and culture become really uh, murky in terms of the distinction between them, um, as especially as we go back historically. So in a very clear way, police chiefs uh, often said to me something along the lines of, you know, we adapt, we adapt, we learn to adapt to the law. And so I definitely think that there is a clear, in their view, sort of sense that laws get passed and police chiefs, police departments have to figure out how to accommodate them. And that's not just with gun laws, that's with any kind of law. Um, police chiefs have to respond to respond to the laws. Uh, now, the question though is how they respond. So we know that police uh, organizations don't just passively accept whatever law is passed. Um, they organize, they're politicized. And so saying that, sure, they adapt raises the question then, okay, so why are you willing to adapt? Why would you adapt in this way? Why have you, why has it been so easy for you to adapt? You know, for example, in Arizona, um, Arizona actually passed their concealed carry law a, a little um, later than other states. And so part of that was because open carry was always sort of a, a, a norm here. Uh, and yeah, chiefs were like, yeah, that was really odd when that happened. And, you know, we didn't like it, but we adapted. And, um, you know, that's that's something that I think is really powerful. A Michigan chief told me, you know, when, when concealed carry went into effect uh, in the early 2000s with shall issue in Michigan, he was like, I thought it was going to be basic, you know, he, he, he really thought this was going to be a total disaster. And he said, you know, I was wrong. I was wrong. And so the willingness to see that you're wrong and, and admit that, uh, I think is not just simply like a question of the law. It's a question of the politics 
rights and the, the cultural context and with that in which that law comes to um, be enacted, as well as um, the tools that that police have for thinking through and making sense of that law. And, you know, that's a whole complicated, um, you know, set of debates in the policing literature about how police actually understand uh, what it is that they do and how they do it. Because in fact, when you look at the law and you look at um, you know, the question of enforcement, there is so much, this is this is the whole politics of discretion, right? There's actually, you know, the, the gap between reality and what the law purports to give you as tools, as law enforcement, uh, is actually very, it's, it's quite yawning. So, so that's my first kind of response to that. But my second uh, response to that is that, of course, I would also think through, and I try to make this point in the book, that you know when we think about gun laws and sort of the culture, the politics, the legal apparatus regarding the police, these are actually growing from the same sort of cultural, social, historical soil. If we look back in the history, at the history of policing in this country, uh, policing has has from you know for when we look back in the mid 1800s and, and beyond, uh, policing has um, not been monopolized by the state. It's something that, you know, it was seen at one point as sort of this everyday duty, much like uh, concealed carry is seen by concealed carriers, this everyday duty uh, to, you know, to participate in the maintenance of social order. And that is sort of ebbed and flowed in terms of how again, how that um, sort of prerogative to police is shared across society. Uh, we think about police as monopolizing that because we, we are oftentimes our reference is, you know, the 1960s onward, but we can think about slave patrols, we can think about, um, you know, genocidal posses in the West, um, you know, harming and brutalizing indigenous peoples, we can think about the night watch, we can think about all these forms in which actually we can root today's law enforcement as well as today's gun culture in these different, um, you know, these different kind of um, apparatuses, practices of policing. And it's it's very complicated, obviously. But yeah, so I would say that what we're getting at with these different kinds of ways of articulating gun populism is something that transcends either guns or police, but actually is at the, the root of both of them. Yeah, that makes sense. So you talked a little bit um, at the beginning about how you didn't just interview these chiefs, you also sat in on these gun licensing boards in Michigan that at the time of your interviews were open to the public um, and in fact no longer exist, as you said. Um, can you talk about what those boards looked like um, when you were there, how you saw these two frames played out in the hearings? Um, and then maybe if there's anything surprising or that stood out to you from, from watching those yeah. Yeah. So one of the uh, kind of long standing issues in the study of race and racial dis disparities in, in criminal justice outcomes, whether it's arrest, tickets, uh, stop and frisk, sentencing, conviction, uh, but especially on the policing side, is really nailing down sort of race as. As, as the key factor versus other factors that could be conflated. So, you know, the whole sort of, um, you know, the 90s, there was a lot of uh, criminologists who spent a lot of time uh, substantiating that, you know, driving while black, that that is, um, you know, that that has, uh, it, it effectively serves as suspicious, uh, as suspicious enough enough to warrant a police stop. That that is the, you know, that it's not the make and model of the car. That it's not, you know, it's 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 race that's driving this and racial profiling. So I, I kind of came into this study wanting to do a similar thing with guns uh, and, and try and understand, you know, can we can we kind of focus on the, the racial profiling aspect? Is there a racial profiling aspect in terms of how gun laws are enforced? Now, I wasn't just interested in sort of the crime, the crime side, but also the, the, the lawful gun access side. So who is denied a gun license versus given a gun license? Is there a racial, dis a racial disparity and a disparity that is 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 about race. It's not conflated with something else that, that's going on there. And one of the problems with doing this, of course, is that those records in terms of you know gun licensing, gun registration, concealed carry are generally sealed to the public. Uh, you cannot Freedom of Information uh, Act request them. You you can't get access to them. And that's that's partly the result of, of NRA lobbying to, to have those things um, sealed. So one of the only ways of actually getting at this was to attend, as you mentioned, these gun boards in Michigan. So very, very few states have them. Uh, I think only a couple of states still have them in any form whatsoever. Michigan actually abolished theirs. Uh, and I can talk about what, what replaced it. 
But at the time of my research, basically they were these county level boards that were staffed uh, almost entirely by former or current law enforcement. And essentially people who were called to this board and it was an, admi an administrative board. So it was not a court, it was an administrative board. And they, they would be called to this board if basically something, um, something happened to put their concealed pistol license in jeopardy. So they were rejected, their license was rejected, their application, uh, their license was suspended um, or it was revoked or um, yeah. So rejected or denied, suspended or revoked. And basically this board gave people the opportunity to uh, contest, you know, contest their the, the decision, deal with their criminal record if they had a criminal record and, um, you know, try to try to, to get a gun license essentially. So yeah, this was actually um, one of those uh, just incredibly eye-opening experiences. What I like to say is that you can be pro-gun pro rights, you can be pro-gun control, whatever your ideas about gun law are and gun policy, if you walked into these rooms and, and, and auditoriums and saw what was going on, uh, you would be horrified no matter what side of the debate you were on. Um, in terms of you know how decisions were made to give people licenses, how decisions were made to not give people licenses. And so what I sort of um, saw very blatantly and it wasn't, you know, a lot of times, you know, it, it, the way race sort of shapes things can be very subtle or it can be very blatant. And this was this the sort of racial breakdown of how people were treated differently vis-a-vis -vis their gun license was um, was was really blatant. So, for example, uh, just to give you one really clear example in the state of Michigan you have to disclose, or at least at the time of my research, you have to disclose if you're stopped by a police officer, if you have a concealed pistol license and you're currently carried. You need to tell that police officer that I, I ha I'm a licensed concealed carrier and I'm, I'm carrying a firearm. If you don't do that, you um, will get a, a some kind of suspension, a six month suspension for um, on your license. So when white applicants came to gun board because of this, uh, they were generally just told, don't do this again, make sure you disclose and you know your license is reinstated, it's been six months. When African American claimants came, um, they were in, they were quizzed. They were asked, "What do you do? Uh, what are you supposed to say to the officer?" Uh, they were instructed on exactly where to put their hands, exactly how to hold their bodies. Uh, they were told that the officer is going to see them as a threat, and they should understand that, and that their their job is to make the officer at ease. And so, the way I kind of talk about this in the book is that this isn't you know this is obviously playing into to stereotypes that a white person with a gun. Um, is a good guy with a gun and can be presumed to not at least not be an active threat, whereas um, a person of color, an African American with a gun, um, can be presumed to be a threat. And so, part of the conditions, the racially disparate conditions of that license, even if they're formally, it's a formally colorblind, um, you know, system of issuance, there is still this implicit um, racially disparate condition that. African Americans who carry guns need to internalize the gaze of the of the police officer and internalize the the sort of viewing of themselves as as dangerous um, by virtue of having that gun, even though that gun is legal. So that was just um, an incredibly uh, eye opening experience looking at those proceedings, and it is uh, it is. You know, I, I understand the the reasons why. I, I understand. I, I understand all the arguments about privacy, and you know, I, I, um, I that obviously is a huge debate. But I do think that we are really missing something big by not having access to how these decisions are being made. And I think that if we had, if this was clear, we actually on all sides of the debate, we we'd probably be much more up in arms in terms of how the not just laws that are passed, but the actual enforcement on the ground happens. And, you know, if there's one sort of message of the book, I think first is that race is absolutely crucial for understanding both the politics of police and the politics of guns. Um, but the second key point, I think the second key takeaway is that we absolutely cannot leave the conversation, whether we're on regardless of what side of the debate we're on, we can't stop the conversation at merely passing laws because what matters for people who look, um, you know, who are on, for whatever reason, on whatever side of the debate uh, engaged in um, engaged in this issue, what matters is how gun laws are actually enforced and how they're enforced, we have to understand the perspective of the police. Uh, we, can't, we can't simply go off of, you know, the, the intentions of lawmakers because um, yeah, that's as, you know, sociologists and legal scholars, you know, talk about the policy implementers are are not just at the sorry, the policymakers are not just, you know, in in the 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 lawmakers and the elected politicians, they're also the frontline workers.
Yeah, so this actually gets at one of the questions we have in the queue, and I'll just remind if anybody has questions, um, feel free to type them into the, the Q&A, but one of them builds off of this, and maybe the answer is that what well, you said, we don't have good data on it, but one of the questions is, um, you were looking at a jurisdiction that had a shallow issue regime, and you saw tons of discretion, and that discretion exercised mm -hmm. in a racialized manner. Um, do we have statistics, or have you seen anecdotal evidence in May issue regimes that or in, in, yeah, in May issue regimes that make it look worse? Or do you think what your kind of study shows is that there's always gonna be discretion in the system and it's always gonna be exercised in a racial way. And so maybe it's not even better to have a shallow issue regime. Yeah, that's a really difficult. So the question is basically is a May issue, do these racial disparities get worse when we look at a May issue regime? Um, so a lot of this is, you know, answering that question, obviously historically, we know that the invention of a May issue regime is rooted in you know, and again, this is like a, going back to that question of like, is it the, you know, how does gun policy interface with the war on crime? What's, you know, what's the chicken and the egg? Well, actually, it's this broad apparatus that is, you know, pushing, pushing, um, you know, different technologies of, of racial domination, white supremacy, and racial inequality. And it happens to be that gun laws get implicated in all of these things for, you know, and, and we can talk about why gun laws are, are a particularly appealing um, vector of, of these dynamics. But, um, but yeah, so, so, you know, in the same, same way that sort of gun militarism uh, interlocks with the war on crime, we see that with the May, you know, with, with gun laws under, under the Jim Crow system. And so we certainly know that May issue is open to all sorts of discretion um and and that that can happen now as far as whether that actually is happening um you know, anecdotally, I think that class tends to be, and this may just be because of the way it's framed in the um, it, within gun rights discourse. But within gun rights discourse, it definitely seems that class seems to be the 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 bigger issue. Like the select the elites, the celebrities of Hollywood can get their guns, but you know, the the everyday person can't can't get their firearm license. You know, in LA County or what have you. Uh, so I think that there definitely is a rhetoric of that going on. But as far as what that actually looks like, other than you you know, reports of seeing who's getting the license. Um, I, there's not a lot of like systematic data. And the other thing I want to point out too, is that it's not just who gets the license, right? So I think there's this understanding of uh, sort of, you know, either I have the gun or I, I don't, if I have the license, I can, I'm fully exercising my rights and it's great. And I'm, you know, fully, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm exercising my second amendment rights. And that might be the experience for people who can presume that when they interact with law enforcement, that they will be seen as a law abiding person. And given the presumption of, of innocence, uh, that their gun, um, you know, actually enhances their standing as, um, a res you know, civically re resp responsible person. Um, this actually happens happened to me during my um, my my research for citizen protectors when I interacted with public law enforcement. And so, you know, that that is one way of interfacing with and exercising rights. But the other way of interfacing and exercising rights is claiming those rights, exercising them, but also exercising them with the understanding that they are always, um, they're always provisional and based on the ability, capacity, willingness of, you know, the, the, the law enforcement agent, for example, to, to recognize you as a rights bearing person. And that presumption does frankly cannot be assumed for people who, people of color who, um, you know, oftentimes who are armed or interacting with law enforcement. That's not to say it never happens. That's not to say that police are, you know, treat every, you know, to, just operate in this robotic, racially disparate way. But when we see cases like Philando Castillo, when we see cases like the the person I interviewed for my first book that I discussed earlier, who was, um, you know, stopped by police uh, for his openly carried firearm, uh, it becomes really clear that the the exercise of rights feels different, is a different kind of act uh, for people who are can presume to be seen as rights bearing citizens in the full capacity versus people who who can't make that assumption. Yeah. Um, so we got a good cue. Let me go to um, some of the audience questions, though. So one question is, um, is it realistic to believe that changes to police training procedures will be sufficient to reduce the likelihood of poor choices by police officers, particularly in communities of color, or to use their guns to enforce their authority rather than to protect their safety and the safety of others? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's, I mean, training, that's- Is training, training going to be enough? 
Yeah, is training going to be enough? I mean, I think that if it was going to be enough, it would have already been enough. I think that that's, that's what a lot of, you know, and it's, it's not just, I, I should say, it's not just police training and we should be really clear what we're, sorry, it's not, it's not just police that this is, you know, that we could say this about. So two things. First, we should be really clear when we're saying police training, what are we actually saying? Are we saying we're going to, um, you know, train police in use of force and, you know, this is what you do to, like, this is, this these are all, you know, this is how you restrain a suspect and this is how you do all this stuff. And then also say, okay, at the end, we're going to do implicit bias training and tell you about racial stereotypes. Uh, are you going to train police in de-escalation um, and actually spend more time on de-escalation than use of force? Um, that's something that would be, I think, pretty radical in terms of how a lot of police agencies uh, conduct their training. Um, and so there's, so, okay, so first of all, the, the question of training is, is a big one. Uh, and then the other, the other, I guess, the last kind of piece of training so, so you know, de-escalation, implicit bias, also um, mental health. We do not support police with regard to mental health. Um, that is, we don't support in this country mental health very well at all. And you know, it's funny when police people say uh, we need to stop police militarization. If police were actually militarized and actually <laughs> took their cues from the military, we would have a conversation about PTSD with police. We would actually have a lot more mental health sort of awareness with regard to talking to police police and talking to sort of, um, you know, what, what now is basically taken up by police subculture and, and kind of referring to what I said earlier, you know, a lot of what police do to sort of cope with what they're doing is, is turn to these sort of tropes of good police work like the warrior, because there is no other alternative because we, we don't, we don't support mental health with police. Um, okay. So, so there's all those things. Um, as far as training though, uh, particularly with the implicit bias stuff, because I think that's usually what people are talking about when they say we need to train police to basically not be right. Like, don't be racist. Think about your racial stereotypes and just stop being racist. Uh, there's actually been studies that show that not only does that not work, but it can actually prime people to, um, to engage in more uh, racially disparate uh, behaviors. And that's not just with regard to police, that's across the board with regard to, you know, implicit bias training that I might take as a university professor. So this implicit bias training, I think that there's a lot of sort of, um, it, it's a very comforting sort of approach to, to dealing with these really deep seated issues that if we can just sort of name our biases, we'll be freed from them. And, you know, we can all go along our merry way and sort of not fundamentally re-envision uh, sort of the the originating purposes of why we have police and what we expect uh, police to do, why we call them. Uh, there's actually data that shows that whites actually have more interaction with police than people of color because whites are initiating that that interaction. And so that's something that we need to really grapple with. So I don't I don't think that training is enough. And I haven't seen training that fundamentally um, th that I, I haven't I haven't seen a set of sort of, um, you know, the I don't want to use the obvious term that I could use here because it just seems wrong. But the 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 panacea, I'll use that term for, um, you know, for in terms of training, I have not seen that. And I, I don't think it exists because I think that dealing with this means not just dealing with what, what police do, but also the organizational and institutional apparatus in which police operate, but then fundamentally also ourselves. I think that this is a huge, um, you know, this is a point that actually Egon Bittner made uh, when he was working in the 70s, uh, you know, do, being an ethnographer of police work. And he says, you know, in a democracy, we do this sort of perverse thing where we basically make police deal with the problems we society doesn't want to deal with. And then we blame them when they screw up. And okay, we should be, we should be, I mean, these are not small screw ups. These are our massive, um, you know, the massive taking of lives, but we need to also step back and also think about what our investment is in having this kind of power in, in um, you know, invested in police. And so I think that's, yeah, I, I so I, I wish I could say there's some quick fix, um, but I don't think there is without uh, interrogating what police do, the institutions in which they work and ultimately ourselves. Yeah. Um, so one other question we have is, um, and then this goes back to you know, the early chapters in the book about the relationship between the Second Amendment community and police. Um, mm -hmm. What does your research show about gun rights rhetoric around police incompetence or corruption, mm -hmm. the, the, the view kind of that the, the government, including police, are the bad guys? Um, for example, uh, this person says, I'm aware that there's a threat in gun rights rhetoric that claims that police 
are not more accurate with their weapons and or police are being more inclined to domestic violence. How, how does that um, kind of fit the mold here? Yeah, you know, that's super interesting. And I think that that is, so, okay, so the first thing to kind of point out is that there's multiple threads within pro-gun discourse, right? Uh, there is very sort of conservative, traditionalist threads, there's more li libertarian threads. And so depending on where sort of the, the traditionalist versus libertarian kind of where on that spectrum someone is, they're going to have very different attitudes on the police. I think that an all out sort of, um, you know, anti-police uh, sentiment that we we sometimes hear, I think is actually um, relatively rare. I don't think, um, I think that, yes, there definitely are, um, you know, particularly within the open care community, I think there's people who, who reject the idea of, um, you know, public law enforcement in part because they see it as disempowering people from this civic duty to, to police and protect themselves. Um, so, so I certainly think that's there. Uh, but what I guess I, the way I would at, answer the question is to kind of call attention to sort of how the historical moment at which we're operating really sh is, is really illuminating for how that, you know, in terms of how the chips actually fall with that. So with regard to, and this kind of hops over to my, um, you know, my current research, which is on, on gun sellers actually, but I think there's a lot of anti, so there's obviously a lot of anti-statism and especially, so if you would have said like the FBI and the federal government, I would have said, yeah, that's totally ATF. That's totally across the board with, um, you know, people who are really embedded and, and articulate with regard to, to gun rights and gun culture and, and all these things. Um, but I think that, you know, when, when you actually talk to people about sort of abstractly, like, what do you think about law enforcement? They'll pull, pull out all these, you know, all these criti you know, criticisms and, you know, they're incompetent, they won't be there. There's a difference between they're corrupt and incompetent and they won't be there, obviously. I think though, once you have things like, um, the perception of civil unrest, the perception of sort of social chaos. So everything that's happened over the last year, you're not necessarily saying, you know, you're not necessarily hearing people say, you know, oh, this is, you know, we don't have any, like all police are, are totally competent and not corrupt, but there is sort of a embrace of this is why, this is why we need police and this is why we need to be armed. So it's not seen as sort of an antagonistic thing. It's seen as we need, like, this is the moment to, you know, to, to, basically, you know, be in arms together. And you see this from the police side as well. Obviously, you know, the, the words of appreciation to Kyle Rittenhouse, um, you know, you have officers basically saying like, we're glad you're out here. We're, we're glad you're patrolling. And um, yeah, so I think that there is kind of this, um, you know, this, this intertwining. And then finally, like with the NRA, you really see very clearly uh, the NRA trying to promote, um, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll definitely, and this was in the 90s, I think a little bit more calling out sort of police as, um, you know, they're, they're not going to be there when you need them kind of thing. But there is a huge emphasis on sort of now, if you look at um, the, the NRA rhetoric on policing, that police are in the same fight as you are, gun rights people. Like they are also fighting, you know, the progressives, the crime, you know, and there's, I mean, there's very evocative, the, the clenched fist, obviously, video um, really lays this out um, where where it's it's sort of, and again, it's this, this militarized sort of understanding of we're in a war and we're, we're fighting it together. So um, yeah, so that's, that's kind of how I see that. And I think that whereas for my first book, if I would have, if you would have asked me that question, I would have said, oh yeah, that's, that's very prevalent. Um, and that, you know, you see that is definitely a, a, a line that you hear. I think it still is a line that you hear and it's very prevalent. But um, what I'm seeing is that that line is kind of, it, it's, it's very easy for, uh, it seems for people to step away from that when they're faced with, um, you know, different circumstances of social, social uh, real or imagined social collapse and chaos. Yeah. So we've got about one minute left. Let me just throw out one final question just to get your thoughts on. Um, so after you had completed the book, there kind of was a, a nationwide rethinking of the role of police uh, taking place with greater urgency. What lessons do you think your research offers to those considering the place of public law enforcement in a context that views legitimacy of violence through a racialized lens and I'm thinking of defund movements and the like. What, what kind of role does your research play in informing those debates? Yeah, I think my research suggests that we can't have these debates separately. We can't talk about gun violence over here and police violence over here. If we are going to address 
either of those, we have to see them as interconnected. And one of the things that I think is really interesting and encouraging is that there has been more of a, a willingness to see that and more of a willingness to see that, you know, this is, we can't separate out, you know, different kinds of gun violence and focus on just the mass shooting or just suicides or just, um, you know, whatever kind of, of particular gun violence. And, you know, even with, um, you know, you even see actually on the gun violence prevention gun control side, you know, people tweeting things like gun, you know, police violence is gun violence. That's a pretty big shift in the in the narrative. And that's where, yeah, I mean, basically my, my book is an argument for why we can go down the path of sort of, um, you know, just looking at one or looking at the other. But if we do, we are, we are basically res resigning ourselves to, to really not fundamentally addressing either of them. Perfect. Well, that comprehensive note is a good way to end it. Thank you very much for joining us. We really appreciate hearing your perspective. Thank you so much. Thanks.